We'll give folks a few minutes to join us. Okay, it looks like we've got a few more folks still joining. I'll give us a few more minutes and um, I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Barber, and I'm here with the Metro Planning Department. And we will be discussing um, tonight's uh, meeting. We'll be discussing Porter Road and Cahal Avenue, the East Nashville Community Plan Amendment. Um, today is Monday, May 16th. The meeting is uh, supposed to start at 6 p.m. If there are any questions, please. Um, Place them in the chat and we will do our best to address them as we um, move through the presentation. <clears throat> Tonight with us, we have council member Emily Benedict, um, myself, Andrea Barber on planning staff, uh, Ms. Anita Craig, and then the applicant team, Josh Rowland and Kimley Horm and Mackenzie Trent with Trent Development Group. Um, council member Benedict, would you like to say a few words to us? Absolutely, Andrea, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for attending this meeting. This is being recorded. And so I'll share this out on my um, newsletter as well as out on social media to make sure everybody has the chance to hear what we're discussing tonight. What I wanna make sure that everybody understands is, uh, this, is this call is specifically about the underlying policy, the community plan change that would need to take place in order for the development as you've seen it um, and as it's been designed, the up to 750 town, um, apartment units or townhomes um, com combination, restaurant, retail, um, rather uh, grocery, hopefully. Um, all of that is a, um, something that would happen as the result of a community plan change. And so we're gonna talk tonight about that community plan change. Uh, this is the fifth meeting that we've held with the public. Uh, the first two were with existing residents and then the remaining were with the public. And I know the applicant has had meetings with neighborhood associations as well. So as we go through this again, this is about the underlying policy, 
but we will touch on what the development is and what that means. Uh, as, as, as I've stated in every communication, and I wanna make sure it's clear and that people loudly hear this, the existing residents who live at Berkshire Place today are of the highest priority to me. And so the developers, the Trent Development Group, and I have worked diligently to try to come up with plans and are committed to finding a way to create affordability within the new development. We don't know yet what that's gonna look like, so I don't wanna make any commitments today, but that is a commitment that we have to continue to look at to make sure that all of the existing residents land softly wherever they would like to land. Um, I think it's important for you, the public, to understand that I'm aware of the 119 kids that are enrolled in, in MNPS. And at one point in time, when we did a snapshot, there were 226 kids in total at the site. It's important to, we, to me that we make sure that those kids and their families land exactly where their families want them to land. So um, I'm pleased, um, I'm very pleased with the reaction, the response, and the um, the forethought that Trent Development Group and, and community um, consideration that they've given to make sure that that is handled um, in a way that I think is appropriate and, um, and, and is going to, again, help everybody land softly. That's really the best way for me to put it. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop my comments now. I think it's important to set the stage with that information in place. I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea, who's going to take us through the presentation, and then she'll um, uh, turn it over to the applicant team, and we'll have some good Q&A, and I look forward to hearing from everybody. It's so important that I hear from you. You can reach me at, um, well, I'm sure we'll have this in the chat or make it available. If, if you don't already have it, it's emily.benedict at nashville.gov. And I really look forward to hearing your feedback based on what you see tonight. Andrea, thank you so much. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Benedict. My apologies for those of you on um, the other side who are seeing a gray box on the presentation. I am hosting this and also presenting. So please forgive me on my technical skills. Um, but I seem to have gotten the box removed. So if you were seeing a box on the screen where you should be seeing a PowerPoint slide, my apologies. It's gone. Um, so moving forward with tonight's agenda, everyone can see my next slide. Let's see. Okay. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about the purpose of this meeting. Um, I'm going to provide some background information. We're going to talk a little bit about policy and zoning, uh, the requested land use policy, um, the applicant presentation, and then questions and discussion. So why are we here? Um, so the applicant wishes to change the current land use policy um, at the property of 1510 Branch Street and 1500 Porter Road. Um, and so uh, what we'll be hearing about tonight is the described proposed changes, um, to explain the process and then gather your feedback and then making recommendations to the planning commission. So the applicant has submitted an application to the Metro Nashville Planning Department requesting to change the land use policy for the area outlined in red on the map. Um, it's very early in the review process for this application. Um, the planning department is hosting tonight's meeting in order to explain the requested changes to the East Nashville Community Plan and to provide an opportunity for the community members um, to ask questions, express concerns, and to let us know your thoughts. Okay, so there has been a request land use policy change area outlined in red, and it's requested to amend the East Nashville Community Plan by changing the urban neighborhood evolving T4NE um, and the, well, and to leave the, the existing uh, urban neighborhood center T4NC to two properties loca located at the corner of Cahal Avenue and Porter Road. Um, these properties are currently zoned uh, mixed use limited MUL and then R6, which is one and two family residential, um, approximately 117 feet south of Rebecca Street. And the particular properties that we're discussing tonight are about 19.93 acres. So how does this all fit in together? Um, <clears throat> so Nashville uses community plans as a means of applying Nashville Next, which is the county, which is the countywide long range plan. Um, so within the Nashville Next, there are 14 community plans. East Nashville is one of those 14 plans, along with other plans that guide the development and preservation that should occur within each community. 
So that's what we're here discussing tonight. Should this plan, should this policy be amended? So in order to implement the vision established in the community plan, we use land use policy, which addresses the form and character of a development. Um, every property in the Nashville area has a land use policy referred to as a community character policy. Each policy is defined in this document, the community character manual, and these policies are standard by which future zoning change requests are measured. Um, the community character manual is a 318 page document. It is located on our website for anyone who would like to review it. Um, but it does explain the transects, which we'll be talking about tonight, T4 transect. Um, the elements within that, which are neighborhood center and corridor, then the intent of that particular policy, which is maintenance, enhancement, or creation, and then the, the, the policy that we'll be discussing. So a majority of East Nashville is in um, the T4 urban transect, um, but throughout the county, uh, the transects range from T1 to T6. So why policy matters? <clears throat> policy is important because it is the guidance that rezoning requests are me measured against. If, if a zoning request is supported by the existing policy, there is a higher likelihood that the planning commission will recommend approval. If the request is not supported by the existing policy, planning commission is unlikely to recommend approval. So an applicant may apply to change a policy that does not support the current zoning change. I'm sorry, does not support the zoning request. Um, so in this case, the applicant is requesting a zone change to a zone that is not supported by the existing policy. So along with the rezoning request, there is also requesting um, change to the policy. <clears throat> Many of you may be asking, what is the difference between land use policy and zoning? Um, so like I stated before, each property in Davidson County has a policy and a zoning district. Policies provide guidance and represent the vision for an area. Um, applying a policy change with a plan amendment does not change the current zoning. So we're here talking about policy tonight. With this case, we see the requested area and currently zoned mixed use limited in ULR6. The applicant has applied to change the zoning to a specific plan, SP. The specific plan SP district is a zoning district which provides additional flexibility to create developments that meet the goals and objectives of Nashville Next and are sensitive to the surrounding context. So today we're looking at the existing land use policy, which is urban neighborhood center um, in the purple. Um, and then the, the beige portion of the map is urban neighborhood evolving T4NE. And so the requested land use policy for the site is for it to be T4NC, which is shown in purple. So that purple would be extended um, to, that, to that entire area parcel that's outlined in red. Um, and that is along Cahal Street and Porter Street, Porter Road, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so currently there are two policies for this area. Um, T4NC, uh, which is applicable to areas where there is a concentration of land that is zoned use or intended to be used as mixed use and commercial. And then there's T4NE, which is urban neighborhood evolving. And that policy is applicable to include greater housing choices, improved connectivity, and more creative, innovative, and environmentally sensitive development techniques. So the intent for um, urban neighborhood center T4NC is there are some general characteristics here. So commercial mixed use, residential and institutional land uses, um, services to meet the daily needs of the residents. Um, typically those are within five to 10 minute walks. Um, intensity generally is placed within the edges. Um, regularly spaced buildings built to the back edge of the sidewalk with minimal space be spacing. Parking behind and beside the building. Um, consistent use of lighting and formal landscaping. High levels of connectivity with complete street, complete street networks. Um, so that includes sidewalks, bikeways, um, and existing or planned mass transit. And then clearly distinguishable boundaries identified by land uses, building types, 
um, building placement and block structure. And so um, I have taken, um, there are a few examples of other um, T4 urban neighborhood centers, T4 NCs throughout, um, throughout Nashville that I've provided. Um, just a basic general location of where it is, um, a map, the CCM map, which is the community character manual <clears throat> that would show where the different NCs are located, um, an aerial view of these different NCs and street view. So the first one we're looking at is at 400 Cleveland Street. This is an example of another one at 224 South 11th Street. And this is another neighborhood, urban neighborhood center T4NC for those who are trying to get an idea of what that looks like. The third example, 2907 12th Avenue South. This is also another example of um, what, what T4NC can look like. And then the fourth example is at 18, uh, 1898 Eastland Avenue. And again, this is another T4NC. So with that, um, I'm going to turn this over to the applicant presentation. Give me just a moment to make them presenters and to get their slides loaded. Andrea, can you see that okay? Yes, I can see it on my end and yes, I'm able to see it. Great. Well, let me know when you're ready for me to start. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Josh Rowland. I'm with Kimley Horn and we're the consultant for Trent Development Group that is uh, that serving as the applicant for this project uh, and the land planning and civil engineering. Uh, we've also got a, an architecture team with Smith, Smith G Studios that's been an integral part to our master plan and vision for the project. Uh, I may have met uh, many of you on the call as we've had uh, quite a few public outreach opportunities over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. So um, for those of you that are new to the project, we look forward to hearing your comments tonight and uh, answering any of your questions. <clears throat> uh, first slide I have up is just a quick kind of overview of our policy change request. Um, as Andrea mentioned, we're currently um, next to the existing neighborhood commercial T4NC uh, neighborhood center uh, policy here in the heart of uh, South Inglewood. And the main uh, request for our project is to expand the uh, neighborhood center uh, policy in this location to um, encompass uh, a wider uh, stretch along Cajal and Porter Road. So that's that's the general nature of our request. Uh, I'm going to give you some graphics that will help you kind of better understand what that request looks like um, from a development standpoint. Um, we rotated the map about 90 degrees clockwise. So Cahal is to the right-hand side and South Inglewood Park is here uh, north and across Cahal Avenue. And then Porter Road is uh, on the bottom side of the page, the south side. Um, you can see the, uh, the gas station and the laundromat down here to the south. Um, I'll be brief tonight, but we just wanted to kind of share with you our, our vision for this project. Um, uh, as an overview, we have uh, a broad mix of housing uh, along with uh, a broad mix of commercial uses in this site. Uh, our vision for this project is to create a, a great pedestrian and walkable development for the South Inglewood neighborhood, something that all the residents in this area and from those outside of the neighborhood can come and um, really enjoy you know, uses such as restaurants and shopping, um, we have the, we have plans for a grocery store and marketplace here in our kind of our main street corner anchor. Um, 
we have a mix of housing options as well from uh, studio and one and two and three bedroom apartments to townhome uses as well as uh, stacked flats and condo type uses and really the one of the most unique and kind of great additions to the community is going to be our our central amphitheater park that is connected through a, a pedestrian plaza over to the south inglewood park as we kind of zoom in on this you can really start to see how we've pulled buildings away from the street and created wide pedestrian walkways with water features and landscaping um, that really terminates here at the center of our development with uh, a public amenity building that will have uh, space for the public to use for events, an amphitheater style park that has a large hardscape and stage element that will really serve as the, as the focal point to this community uh, and is you know, directly linked over to South Inglewood Park. Uh, we've talked with parks and with Emily Benedict and with planning staff about uh, potential upgrades to South Inglewood Park as a part of this. We feel like that's a, a great asset to the neighborhood. So uh, one of the key components of this development is to also create some improvement around this park and um, kind of join these two portions of South Inglewood together. Uh, with that, I'm going to just run through a couple of images that we have that just characterize uh, the, the nature of some of these zones here. But before I show you those, I'm just going to walk through them with you real quick. We've got basically our, our commercial node here in the, um, the area adjacent to Cajal. We're proposing two restaurants and two mixed use buildings that have uh, commercial and retail below and some residential above. And then we have a, a main multifamily building that will have structured parking that's completely hidden uh, and wrapped by residential units. We'll also have a large courtyard space that has a, a public, publicly accessible pass-through. Um, this building here would be around four to five floors as it steps up the hill. Um, as you know, this is a, a fairly hilly site and steep, so the best way to get um, development in a condition like this is to put the parking in a parking structure and wrap units around that. It hides all the parking and really gives the street back to the pedestrians. Uh, we have a second multifamily building south along Porter Road uh, that is three to four stories in height as it steps up the hill. Um, at the corner of Porter Road and Straightway Avenue, we have uh, three-story townhomes. And then up along the hillside, we have our stacked flats, uh, which are two and three-story buildings with parking garages in the back. Uh, we've broken the project up into a couple of different zones. As I mentioned, the first zone on the corner at, at Porter and Cajal um, is a mixed-use building. We're planning a grocery store along our main street in this building with a mix of units uh, and an amenitized uh, part of the project that'll have swimming pools and amenities for the residents. That's here in zone one. <clears throat> Our zone two and three buildings were, excuse me, our zone two is the, the mixed use and commercial area that has the restaurants. Uh, you can see that's um, going to have a lot of character similar to what you see around South Inglewood with a great mix of materials and um, architectural styles to keep this um, a very unique and vibrant neighborhood. Our zone three is the three and four story multifamily building. It also has structured parking with units wrapped around it uh, as it goes down Porter Road. And then zones four and five are the townhomes, the three-story townhomes, and our stacked flats that are up against the hill. We have a couple of images to share that show <clears throat> um, what, that, what those zones look like in, in three dimensions. Uh, but quickly, just to kind of speak to the connectivity and pedestrian oriented nature of the project. We have uh, a new road that we're proposing through the site along this red line uh, that will have on-street parking and wide sidewalks and tree-lined streets. Um, we'll be focused on creating safe zones for cyclists and pedestrians on those streets. And then we have um, other street connections as shown in blue, which are a slightly smaller street section, but again, will have similar characteristics to um, to the other street with on-street parking and tree-lined streets and wide sidewalks for pedestrians. 
I'm going to jump back to this document and just share a few of our images. It, what I had mentioned before, our uh, our focal point of the community is our our town center amphitheater with our community building. Uh, this has an open community uh, facility at the ground level with plenty of open hardscape area for uh, you know a variety of uses such as you know jazz in the park or farmers markets or art fairs with uh, amphitheater seating. Um, the second image is uh, looking south down across Cahal uh, into the, the main entry of the development. We've got our mixed use building with the marketplace on the left hand side and we have our restaurants uh, and mixed use area on the right hand side. And down at the end of this image, you can see the um, community center building at the amphitheater park. Um, our zone one building, that's the four and five story building, as, as I mentioned, we're um, aligning that at the corner of Porter and Cahal. And uh, this is kind of that transition between the um, zone one and zone two buildings where we have uh, a pedestrian pass through. Um, there's also this open public courtyard and our pedestrian pass through in the zone one building as well. And then as you move south along Porter Road and get into the stack flats in the townhome area, uh, this image here shows that uh, more local street that I mentioned, and it has the uh, on-street parking, tree-lined streets and wide pedestrian sidewalks. We've got the, the townhomes on the left-hand side and the stack flats and the manor houses on the right-hand side. So that's just a kind of a brief overview of, of the project. Um, I know that Mackenzie wanted to share a few words as well, and then we're interested in uh, answering any questions or getting input uh, from those on the call tonight. So thank you for your time. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Mackenzie. Thank you, Josh um, and Andrea and Anita and Dustin for, for hosting this for us today. Um, I am with Trent Development Group. I just kind of wanted to give you a little, <clears throat> excuse me, a little overview of, of who we are and what's led us to this point and what our our vision is for the project without, of course, repeating too much of what Josh has already gone over. Um, this is a family business. Uh, my dad has been an affordable housing developer for 35 plus years. Um, Berkshire Place, which is uh, the property that's currently uh, on the Porter and Cajal site. Um, I know that uh, Council Member Benedict, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting distracted by your um, Council Member Benedict already talked a little bit about uh, what we've done with the, that property there and the residents there. Um, he, my dad, it was built in, two, in 1970. My dad bought it in 2000, did a pretty extensive rehab on it, and it is 2022, and, and we would like to rebuild it. It's outdated, and we, we build much better now. Um, so there's lots of reasons why we didn't build it on the site. We don't want to rebuild on the site. Um, one of them being we don't want to evict anyone. Um, I think we're all really well aware of the lack of affordable housing in, in Nashville as it is. Uh, so we are very excited about uh, where we're building the new site um, out in Madison, um, about six miles down the road, down Gallatin Pike, right next to the Madison Regional Park, uh, which has just had a huge renovation a few years back. So we're very excited about the location. Um, I won't go into too much detail about that property unless somebody has questions about it. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it all day, um, but essentially we're, we're Kind of upgrading everything. Um, we're adding more square footage, uh, outdoor amenities, uh, playground, a, a splash pad, a multi-purpose court. Um, uh, probably what we're most excited about is, is in addition to the standard community building that you would build on a on a private uh, multifamily property, um, we're going to double the size of it and provide a bunch of infrastructure. We've partnered with a nonprofit um, to come in and, uh, take care of the residents. Uh, they currently live, uh, have a building on Berkshire place. They do a lot of, uh, summer camps for kids after school care, um, clothing, clothing and food drives, um, holiday events. And they, in the past have done some, uh, job facilitation training. Uh, one of the members of the team has extensive, uh, experience in hospitality. So with the new site, we're building a commercial kitchen where they can do some job training there, uh, some classrooms, lots of infrastructure. Uh, there's tons of potential. We're very excited about it. Um, all of those residents uh, at Berkshire Place, we've talked to them um, a few times. 
Uh, they have access to us over email and, and phone, and they've been in touch and have a lot of questions. And generally, everybody's very excited about it. Uh, we don't expect like 100% of the people to move to Birchstone, which is the, the name of the new development. We, we assume some people will have alternative requests and, and nobody is being forced to do anything. And we have a relocation team that's, that's going to be there to provide them with their options. Um, nobody's going to be paying any extra rent or paying to move. Um, all of that will be taken care of by, by us and our relocation team. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that if anybody has any questions about that, I'm happy to go into it further. Um, uh, in terms of Porter and Cajal, you know, we've been working on this design at least three years. Um, as Councilmember Benedict said, we've had a number of meetings with the neighborhood, um, community leaders, uh, neighborhood associations. We, we've really been interested in the feedback. Um, you know, we are we are from here. Uh, we grew up in Nashville. We're well aware of all of the changing neighborhoods and landscapes all over our city. Uh, some for the better, some for not. Um, and we're well aware that East Nashville and more specifically South Inglewood is its own community, its own culture, its own vibe. And we are not trying to come in and replace it or act like it doesn't exist. We, we simply wanna take advantage of the 20 acres that we have here uh, to build something that will enhance, uh, offer a lot of density that we, we desperately need in the city um, and also bring something for the community. You know, a lot of developments are private and there's a fence. And if you don't have that key fob, paying that rent, you don't get access to anything inside. And so we're very excited about um, kind of creating this neighborhood accessibility and walkability um, that Josh uh, went over with you already. Um, so I won't reiterate it too much, but one of the things we're really we're looking towards the future of development. And while I know that the cars are still the way to get from A to B, that we wanna offer this multiple options of, of transportation. And in order to do that, we have to build the safe infrastructure um, so that people feel safe taking their strollers or their bikes. Um, and we've heard from a lot of you that this, you people uh, in East Nashville love to ride your bikes around. And so we wanna make sure that we have traffic calming measures and we have protected bike lanes and we're building these large sidewalks so that you don't feel like you have to pack the stroller and the SUV to go six blocks um, to visit the park um, or to visit this development. Um, as, as Josh also mentioned, we are very excited about selfishly including this park as extended green space for our development. We've designed it so that it's direct access to and from, and uh, we know that, uh, that Council Member Benedict is also very excited about, you know, getting some, some love from the city uh, uh, to that park and certainly building a large development, including um, access to the park, we think will, will encourage um, new funding and, and new advancements uh, for the park itself. Um, in addition to that, in terms of what we're offering, what we think that the, the neighborhood wants, um, we've, we've really challenged our design team to, you know, not just think about what could fit here, but what uh, neighbors would want, um, what they can benefit from. We have members of our design team who live in your neighborhood, and so they're gonna have to look at this uh, just as well. Uh, so in addition to, you know, what Josh had said about the different types of housing, um, part of the way that we've designed it is that we want it to feel like it's it's a natural evolution of the neighborhood and it's been built over time and it's not just a bunch of townhomes that look the same that have been smacked down. We, we want to really make it feel like this is a natural evolution to the neighborhood and, you know, the way that we're designing our front facing facades that face the street, how do they complement the homes that are across the street and it does so that it doesn't feel alien, it feels like it belongs. I mean, it's going to be 2022 development or not 2022, it'll be a few years from now, but it is going to be new, but we want it to feel like it's not out of place. Um, we want you to feel like you have access to what we think um, the benefits of living in a, a more of an urban suburban area should be, which you should have walkable access to your daily conveniences. And as somebody who has lived in a large city, much larger than, than Nashville, one of the things I miss the most is having uh, a local grocery store or a local convenience store that is not a Walgreens that I can walk to and get whatever I need for the day. Um, in addition to having a coffee shop and whatever retail stores, you know, having a couple of restaurants that can be local haunts for you guys um, would be would be great. We definitely want to push, you know, local vendors, um, you know, are very this this um, amphitheater is very cool. Uh, we think it will be such an addition and such a landmark um, for the neighborhood uh, and as well as this this event space, uh, you know, you guys are artsy out in East Nashville. You know, let's let's get a songwriter night. You know, we want to just provide things for you all to take advantage of um, while we offer this density and, and additional housing. Um, so, you know, we're very excited. We've worked a lot on this. Um, we've reached out to the community and um, 
uh, Council Member Benedict, you know, again, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm repeating what other people have said, but um, we've been very impressed and overwhelmed by the support. Um, I mean, to do that kind of, you know, door to door canvassing, I'm shocked at how many of you opened your doors. Uh, I would not, I would not have. Um, so we really appreciate that you guys have been engaging and we've listened to your feedback. Um, and I'm, I'm anxious to see uh, if there are any other questions um, that those of you who are new um, or those of you who have other ideas, um, we'd love to hear from you. So um, thank you so much for your time um, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Andrea. Thank you, um, Mackenzie, for that. Um, I So I see uh, Council Member Benedict, you have your hand up, so I wanna get to you. And then um, after that, we will start with the uh, Q&A and I do have um, at least one question in the queue. So uh, Council Member Benedict, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Andrea. And I accidentally um, actually left my hand up from earlier when I was an attendee, not a participant. But I just, since I'm I'm called on here, I just want to, uh, uh, you know, share with everybody that what you've heard just now is, I think, very exciting. And as you've heard, I uh, am in general very much support of this. I think it's a really good development for us. Again, I think as I started the call with, it's so important to me that we make sure that anyone who wants to stay in South Inglewood is able to stay there, that we're not, you know, um, uh, moving anybody out who doesn't want to move away, and that we're also doing that in coordination and with protections for those residents, um, including their families, their kids, and their grandkids. So with that in mind, um, I, uh, since you called on me, Andrea, I reiterated my point here, and I look forward to hearing the Q&A. Uh, if I can help answer any questions, I'll just wait to be called on by you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sade, if you could give me presenter rights. Um, we're entering the question and discussion portion of the meeting. Um, so if there are questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, and then I will also be sharing my contact information with my email address and phone number. Um, if you would like to, if you have any additional questions or would like to make a public comment, you can do so. Um, but we have a question, um, and this is, I'll let the applicant team answer this. The question is how many residential units are on the existing property today and how many, resi how many residential units will be in the proposed project along with the projected number of residents? So I'll, I'll read that again so everyone can hear the question. How many residential units are on the existing property today and how many residential units will be in the proposed project along with the projected number of residents? McKenzie, can you confirm how many uh, units you have in the in Berkshire place today? Berkshire has 195 units. Great, so that's total number of units today. Uh, the master plan as it's shown uh, is around 700 units. And those range from one bedroom, you know, economy studio units where you might have a single resident in those units to two and three bedroom townhomes and uh, stack flat style units. So, you know, if you had two to three residents per unit in the existing development compared with, you know, between one and three residents uh, in the uh, proposed development, you know, there's there's an increase in, in density and residents in this area. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons that we were very intentional about providing places, you know, de destinations within the development, making sure that we have those amenities, the, you know, the, the shopping and the grocery, the restaurants, the entertainment, all within this so we can minimize a lot of the out, outbound day-to-day -day trips. Okay, thank you. There is a second question about traffic and more specifically uh, the potential for traffic increase along how? Yes, we prepared a traffic study with this submittal and uh, it does identify the amount of trips that are gonna go on Cahal and on Porter Road. Uh, th there will be some added traffic in the neighborhood. Uh, none of the, um, the figures that we have studied indicate a need for uh, additional traffic signals, but there will be some pedestrian safety um, devices and priorities set for getting pedestrians safely across Cahal to the park and at other intersections. Um, some of the other recommendations of that report are the widening of Porter Road uh, towards the project so that we can add uh, new uh, curb and gutter and detached sidewalk and create a safe uh, 
kind of pedestrian zone along Porter Road. The same thing goes for Cahal uh, and Straightway as well. So a lot of improvements around the site to you know improve. Andrea, if I could add to that, this is Councilwoman Benedict. If I could add to that, the triangle at um, Porter and Cahal, we know that this is a, an intersection that has a lot of concern in the neighborhood. Fortunately, but also unfortunately, there are not many accidents. There are many, many near accidents there. Now, I say unfortunately, we certainly never want anyone to, to be harmed or in an accident. What's unfortunate about it is that we don't have any crash data that suggested, uh, uh, I hate to even say it this way, it needed change. There are changes needed there. We um, Porter Avenue, not Porter Road, but Porter Avenue that leads down the street goes to, um, or creates an issue with the intersection that prevents us from improving it as it is today. If we were to add a stop and that shares with me that it would cause even more danger to the intersection. So, one of the things that I am working on, and I, again, an aspirational goal of mine would be to find some way for NDOT to improve that intersection. Um, the owner of the gas station is a separate owner, and so there's no access to that land today. But I hope that at some point in the future over the coming years that we'll be able to incorporate ways to improve that intersection as a result of um, doing something with that triangle if we're able to again it's private property so nobody knows but certainly improving um, traffic at that intersection is on everybody's radar as we're looking at this and as we're working through this the planning commission will be taking that into consideration as well as a, a robust traffic discussion continues um, however a lot of studies have been done and as i understand it thus far and this will be something that's done as a part of the zoning change more so than as the plan amendment change um, will be specific to the cars that come and go mostly down Cahal towards Gallatin Pike, as well as down Porter Road towards Eastland. I believe most of the traffic study, uh, I think that, that, that Josh just referenced shows traffic going down Cahal and away rather than adding to that intersection I just discussed. However, that intersection is 100% front of mind for me as we look at this as are many of the other priorities that we have, that's one. Thank you, um, Council Member Benedict. Um, we've got about three or four questions and I, I wanna keep us on track for time. It's uh, 6.42, so I'm going to move through these quickly. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat. Our next question um, is about the environment. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do environmentally friendly, such as solar panels or building on the buildings or investment in Nashville solar? So a, a big environmental issue in Nashville is water quality. And that's um, a hot topic uh, on projects such as this. There's um, green, uh, Green ponds that they're called bioretention bio ponds. So water water quality ponds will be a part of the project. Potentially some some green roof options and and other. We're we're at the zoning stage right now, so many of those uh, details uh, have yet to be determined. Um, exactly what what kind of uh, methods we use to to offset um, energy demands and to address uh, water quality issues. But those those are topics that. Are important to us as well, and we'll be getting into those details after the zoning process is completed. Thank you, Josh. Um, there another question coming in. What, if any, information can be given regarding the grocery store or the desired grocery store tenant? Uh, this grocery store space is, you know, around eight to ten thousand square feet as it's currently programmed. So this is going to be one of your Kind of smaller um, local marketplaces, so you know, fresh produce, a lot of you know, dry goods, and and a, and a meat market type deal. But it's you know, if you if I were to compare it to um, another grocer, it, it would be you know, similar to like a, a small Whole Foods uh, type market, but definitely a, a local um, smaller format grocery. Turn up truck was another example of something more local than than whole foods but grab and go fresh produce 
wine, stuff like that. To clarify, Mackenzie, have there been talks with any local grocer or any national grocer? None? No, okay. none at all. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, this next question is with regards to traffic. And the question is, with the increase in traffic, both vehicle and foot traffic, is it planned in the proposal to level the corner of Branch and Cahal for visibility? Councilmember Benedict mentioned some uh, opportunities potentially down the road to improve this intersection. Uh, it, I'm not exactly sure about the, the comment about to level corner of the intersection, but um, there will be a considerable amount of grading and improvements to these roads here that will, um, you know, flatten out any odd or obscured site triangles for the project. So. Those will be details that we'll be taking under careful consideration as we get into the engineering of the project after the zoning. Okay, <clears throat> the second question, um, this is with regards to construction. Um, approximately, would would construction begin and end months and years? And then uh, the, the following comment is, I worry about noise annoyances, especially with working from home being so commonplace now. We shared a schedule in some earlier meetings. Um, the, the first thing that has to happen for this project to take place is for the Berkshire um, redevelopment to occur first. Um, that construction is slated to start uh, this summer uh, of 2022. Uh, we anticipate being complete with the Madison project uh, by the fall of 2023. Um, and that, that allows for residents to start uh, Moving if they choose to to the new uh, the new development in Madison, um, we're planning to get through the zoning uh, process uh, this year and move into the construction documents uh, the following year. But this construction isn't likely to commence until 2024, uh, with the first phases being completed in 2026. Uh, just given the size and complexity of a project like this. Uh, it will likely occur in multiple phases. So if we have our first phase completing in 26, there's gonna be one or two other phases that follow that as well. Thank you. Um, this next question, um, Dustin or Anita, um, I may need your input with, uh, what will the allowance for short-term rentals be in this development? Actually, I can answer that, <clears throat> Andrea. <clears throat> and actually, I'd prefer that uh, uh, Mackenzie answer that, please. Um, we There's a commitment to no. Thank you. There's a commitment to no short-term rentals in this development at all, correct? We don't, we don't want any Airbnb. We got it. Thank you. No. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next question, will bike lanes be physically separated or just white paint like the current streetscape? You know, given the nature of these local streets, uh, they'll, they'll likely be painted because, you know, we want uh, pedestrians and, and cyclists to be able to kind of move uh, freely through the site. So, uh, you know, this isn't a road like, like Trinity or, or Douglas where you might see a lot of through traffic where, you know, the intent here is to really slow traffic down and, and give the, the cyclists and pedestrians priority. So um, bike lanes will likely be painted and not um, not with the plastic bollards as you've seen on busier streets. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question is the intent of the project to seek any LEED certifications if approved. We, we haven't discussed that uh, yet, so there are no uh, goals at this time for LEED certification. Okay, this next one is about housing. What are the affordable options current residents will have to stay in the neighborhood if they don't want to move to Madison? Uh, will there be rent, I'm sorry, will there be rent controlled units as a part of the new development? Um, I'll answer this one. Um, so in terms of options for residents, um, again, we've got this, we have a third party relocation team where this is their job. They're very familiar with, with HUD and um, with, relocating tenants from one apartment building to the next. Uh, so 
If you do not want to go to Birchstone, which uh, will be the is the name of the new development, um, there are other options. Uh, the HUD will provide funding for the state, which will, or maybe it's MDHA, will provide vouchers for those residents who do not want to move to Birchstone. Um, they will not have an increase in rent. We will be giving them three options of affordable, uh, comparable properties that are in the area, assuming that they would like to stay in the neighborhood. Um, with those, those people will, if they choose to move to one of those places, those people, their, their moving expenses will be covered just the same. Um, in addition, we are also talking about if there are some residents who would like to stay and do not want to leave um, and would like to stay through construction that, that because of the way we're uh, building that there will be phases and that we can uh, keep a building or two that, that we will take their vouchers and use that as as rent for them to stay in that uh, building. And then when we build Porter and Cajal, uh, those residents who remained on the site we will accept those vouchers in the units. Um, I, you know, I, I can't confirm in terms of how much affordability we will be able to provide. There is a, a new pilot program that just passed. Uh, with city council that we are going to aggressively pursue that will allow for income restricted units and and mixed income and market rate developments and we are affordable housing developers and we deeply understand the the uh, intense need for inventory in nashville and that it should be affordable housing should be in an unaffordable area it shouldn't be put out in the suburbs where you can you can afford to buy a home, um, although those are valuable as well. But we think they need to be in places where people are being displaced because, you know, a lot of us can't afford a home in, in Nashville anymore. Um, so we are adamant about aggressively pursuing what options we have. Um, we will take advantage of whatever that pilot program will allow us. Um, it's years out. I, I cannot give you any numbers, but in terms of the, the residents on, who are at Berkshire, um, they will get to live where they want to live. Um, we're not going to kick anybody out that, that wants to stay on the property. They will be living on a construction site, so we'll have to, I don't know what how that's going to look, but um, we want to make sure that everybody has all of the options that they want and nobody feels like they're being um, kicked out without, without options. So um, nobody will be paying more in rent, that's for sure. I can follow up on that. I just, I want to reiterate that. This, um, I don't know, maybe I don't, this is not a reiteration from what's on this call, but I've certainly said it many times in public to many different people, um, including on forums. This came to my attention two years ago and it was, um, and it was uh, uh, leaked to the press at the time. And I immediately got a call and they said, this isn't right. We're not sure if we're proceeding. And so then here we go with down the discussion. Well, from the very start, the very first conversation I had was, what level of affordability will be kept there? And the answer was, let's figure it out. Let's find out. We're committed to making sure. Trend Development Group owns Bellwood uh, immediately adjacent to this development. That development is not changing. That also is Section 8 eligible, and that's going to remain affordable going forward, as I understand it. As it I want to make sure that that's yes. Okay, there's a nod. Yes. So, um, same goes with this. The, these folks are committed to creating some level of affordability. They've talked with corporations in town who do affordability, um, like Amazon, for instance. Now, we don't yet have commitment. I don't yet have commitment. I was a co-sponsor of the bill that, that Mackenzie just mentioned, mentioned the pilot, um, the, the mixed use, mixed income development pilot program that we passed just last week at council. The whole goal there is to make sure that we have affordable units kept on site. Um, one part of the question was, will there be rent controlled units? And I will tell you to please contact your state legislature for that. Uh, the governor, the state legislators from around the state, rent control is not something that we're allowed to do in the city of Nashville. I'd love to be able to do it, but we're not allowed to. Um, however, I have a firm commitment that I'm going to be doing all I can to make sure that we that that this new development that that TDG or who however we can possibly get it done there will be affordability in this development. And I think um, if I could, Andrea, there also was a follow up question on short term rentals that I see in the chat. I know I'm not seeing all the questions, yes. but what I see in the chat is regards to short term rentals. The no short term rental piece is memorialized through the law that is the specific plan. 
So at the time that a specific plan, which is the zoning portion of this discussion, when that zoning is done, one of the requirements of the specific plan will be short-term rentals, Airbnbs, verbos are not allowed at all, period, paragraph. All right, Andrea. Back Thank you, you Councilmember Benedict, uh, for responding to that. Um, <clears throat> There is a, an additional question and, and just for a time, we're supposed to wrap up at 7. Um, I just don't want to go over um, beyond 730. So, if there are people still in the chat who have questions, by all means, please ask your questions in the chat and we will get to them. If not, um, you can see my contact information um, on the screen. Now, my email address and phone number. You also can reach out to council member Benedict too, um, with with uh, questions and. Uh, we will get that back relayed back to the planning department. Um, so if there if there is anyone still listening or has or they have questions, don't feel like because it's six fifty five, you can't ask it. Please ask it in the chat, and we'll do our best to um, to respond. Um, <clears throat> there's another question. Given the current process for short term rental permits in Davidson County, okay, you addressed that one. I'm sorry, there were two questions. So I'll finish the question. Given the current process for short term rental permits in Davidson County. How can you make a commitment to no short to no short term rentals at all? And I believe Council Member Benedict answered that. Um, and there was also a previous question about short term um, rentals and just wanting to be able to ensure permanent housing for residents. But I believe that that has all been answered um, by the applicant team and by Council Member Taylor. Andrea, if I could double check, um, owner occupied short term rentals will also not be allowed. No short term rentals. Period. Paragraph. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I believe this. No, we've got a few more questions. Porter Road. Th this question is for uh, traffic. Porter Road is a main artery through East Nashville, connecting Inglewood to Lachlan Springs. The train often cuts off this road for hours, sometimes even days, which causes uh, Crichton and Carter to have high traffic. These streets do not have ha have sidewalks, which creates a danger for residents. What is the city going to do to improve these roadways? Uh, if I could, Josh, could you please speak to, and I don't know if you're able to pull the map up or Andrea, I know we're of course low on time, but um, I guess, Josh, could you speak to the roads that are going to be widened as a part of your project? Yeah. As I mentioned, and I'm sorry, the existing roads is what I mean to say. That's right. The, the widening that will occur with this project is uh, immediately adjacent to the site along Cahal and on Porter Road. There are, the, the city has a major thoroughfare plan that that shows for um, that shows what improvements to roads need to occur when when development takes place. So we'll be widening those roads to uh, the new right of way widths and providing new sidewalks uh, and wider wider pavement for the travel lanes as well along Porter and along Cahal. Thank you. Um, this is a comment and a question. Uh, we live across the street on Porter and are excited about the development, amenities, and upgrades. This area is heavily populated by dog owners. To serve the community, can we have a dog park either in this development or with the upgrades to South Inglewood Park? I'll kick it off to say that I've already proposed that for South Inglewood Park. At this point, it is in the capital improvements budget, but it is in not it is not in any spending plan. So I know that the cost of it is about a million dollars in capital costs to start it. And then we've got to look at the ongoing maintenance costs, which I understand to be about $100,000 a year. Not a huge amount of money. However, we've got to find the space and we've got to find this money to get it going. So from a South Inglewood Park perspective, I'm chasing that down and I continue to chase it down. Um, we've got some good dog parks not too far away, but I absolutely understand the need for one in the area. Uh, personally, as somebody that has three dogs, uh, I love it's good dog park. Nevertheless, that is something we're pursuing. I don't know if there's room within the development, so I'll uh, let you guys answer that. Well, and we're just getting started on some of that, that detailed design dialogue with with Metro staff. And as we talk with Parks and Rec, I mean, that, that's a great suggestion about improvements to be made to South Inglewood Park. The, the development's committed to making improvements to the park and enhancing that for, for the benefit of the entire neighborhood, as well as this development. Uh, and I'm certainly aware of uh, public-private partnerships on improvements like this that allow for some partnership and maintenance as well. So 
that those are great ideas and, and we'll continue to listen to the community as we uh, brainstorm on, on how to improve the park. Okay, Josh, and to follow up with um, speaking about partnerships, um, this next question is, has the development team been approached about a community benefits agreement? And I'm not sure if council member Benedict would also like to address that question. Sure, thank you. So I actually haven't spoken with anybody directly. I've been about a CBA. Um, I have spoken with a number of organizations and I believe I'd like uh, either Mackenzie or Josh or somebody from that team to speak about um, any engagement that you've had with any of those organizations. But I've spoken with folks from um, a number of nonprofits in the area to make sure and, and, and I, uh, that, that we're doing all that we can to make the right investments in our community. I'm a big fan of making sure that we're using um, uh, uh, labor, for instance, that we're working and coordinating with labor unions to make sure that we're um, in, that anybody who's involved has a fair wage and a, a, a great quality of life. So that's certainly a commitment that that I've been looking for. I, we have not broached that topic at this point in depth. Um, certainly, at, rather to say I haven't in depth, uh, but I'd be curious what the uh, uh, what the folks from TVG have done and what their interest is in a CBA. Um, we have not had any direct conversations about um, a community benefits plan. We we um, we are actively pursuing affordable housing and increasing the inventory uh, by 43 units as we move out to Madison. Um, you know, we are fully engaged in, in whatever we can do to, to benefit the community um, and to give back. Uh, we're not quite as big of a development as some of the large uh, companies that have come in, we're, we're a, a small family business. This is a large development and I, I understand the need to give back. So we're, we are more than willing to, to listen, um, but we have not been engaged on anything at, at this time. And I think it's important to Mackenzie and, and for the group, but most importantly for the community to understand the neighborhood for my constituents and for the community to understand that when we talk about community benefits, sometimes it is about labor and the things that I just spoke about, but sometimes it's about, you know, the amenities and adding a dog park and widening the streets and what can we do to ensure infrastructure is up to date, you know, all the way around and uh, make sure that the community benefits um, for decades to come in the area, not just for this parcel, for these parcels, but rather for the entire community. So I went down the path quickly of community benefits agreement as we've seen for things like the soccer stadium and, and other developments around the city. Um, that certainly is something that I'm interested in, but I also wanna make sure that we do to call out when we hear the word community benefit, which direction are we looking at? If we're looking at amenities around the development, I think that's been looked at. If there's other things in mind, please let me know. Thank you. <clears throat> The next question, has the HUD contract transfer been approved? Um, it has not. Uh, it has not been not approved. Let me rephrase, let me clarify. Um, we have had very positive feedback from our local and regional HUD reps, um, but it's gonna have to be the big kids in DC that, that make the decisions. Um, we are very confident with our application and that we've, we're, Every, like I said, our local and regional reps think this is a great idea. Um, the reality is HUD is not gonna give us an, a, trans, a transfer approval until the buildings are there to transfer. So it's it's kind of a at the same time situation. Um, we are still waiting on our funding from Tennessee. So we're um, that the timeline that Josh gave is a few months ahead of schedule, but um, it's, it's gonna kind of have to come all at once uh, but we feel very confident about it. But the answer is until there are buildings in motion and things are being breaking ground, um, HUD is not gonna say, sure, go ahead uh, when there's nothing there. So that's that's where we're at in that process. Okay, this next one is, is more of a comment, but I'm, I'm gonna read it. Um, I'm worried that the mixed use aspect will be reduced for more residential. I've been very supportive of this development, but it would be a huge disappointment if retail was removed that could benefit the neighborhood and create a more walkable neighborhood. 
And with that actually follows well into the next question, which is about Porter and Cajal. And this comment says, Porter and Cajal is a mess uh, for the students who walk back home. Will this be fixed for part of what, what will that be fixed for part of this? So I, I'm assuming they're talking about a stretch of Porter and Cajal with students and, and will that pedestrian connectivity be addressed? Let me speak to the mixed use <laughs> component first. That That's one of our most uh, important aspects of this project and it's it, there's a, a balance here we're we're able to provide that mixed use component the restaurants and the market and and the the retail space because of the units that we're currently proposing the the, the two apartment buildings on the corner as well as the townhomes and the stacked flats th this balance is what allows us to to do the mixed use uh, you know if um if we had fewer units, we wouldn't be a, we wouldn't be able to do the commercial. But with this balance right now, we're, we're actually able to to provide everything that we're proposing, and it's a, it's our intent to do it exactly as the plan shows. That's part of what the specific plan zoning process uh, obligates us to. If, if we're uh, successful with the rezoning, then that's the plan that we have to build. And as far as the pedestrian connectivity goes, um, as I mentioned, we'll be widening uh, Porter Road. Uh, to the south as well as Cajal, and those will create safer pedestrian spaces for students and residents in the neighborhood to have sidewalks that are detached from the street um, and good, good wide, safe sidewalks to walk on. Uh, not to mention as well as through the heart of the development, if, if folks are traversing through the project, they'll have uh, less busy streets to walk on as well as the uh, other Kind of pedestrian only connections through courtyards and public spaces. So I think this really broadens the amount of kind of safe pedestrian zones uh, in and around the area. Um, just to add that that's the kind of feedback we would love to hear if there's, you know, school routes, you know, we, we can't redesign the whole the whole neighborhood, but anything we can do to add to pedestrian safety or convenience or walkability. Um, we are very game for that. I think this is a good time to call out too that um, the site is actually zoned for Rosebank Elementary School, even though it is just a thousand yards or so from Inglewood Elementary. So um, there are quite a few students there who are enrolled in Inglewood Elementary, but most are enrolled in Rosebank Elementary, and then they um, all cluster up to Lytton Middle School. But from a walkability perspective for students that I think was inherent in the question, um, that the the, um, at the pedestrian walkability absolutely needs to be addressed. But I think it's also important for us to understand and, and know that the bulk of the students that live there today go to Rosebank, so that's not walkable. Um, nevertheless, please don't hear your councilwoman say we need to make things less walkable. We need to make everything more walkable. So I, th I think everybody knows that that's my message loud and clear and certainly a part of this as well. Thank you. We've gotten down to the final question again for um, residents who joined us. Uh, this meeting has been recorded. It will be placed online. If you'd like to go back and review it or share with your neighbors or share with the neighborhood association, please feel free. Again, it will be uploaded online. Um, you have my contact information, my email address, and my phone number for any additional questions. Um, but the final question is, what, if any, is the developer's commitment to using local contractors versus, versus out-of-state contractors? Um, you know, that's funny. I just was at another one of our properties talking with the manager there, and that was one of her complaints was that the building that had most recently been built, they used out of state vendors, and it was hard to get them to come in quickly to fix something that was was going on. Um, a lot of that is decided through our construction companies that we use. Um, we think local is preferable um, if available. Uh, so. I don't have any commitments written or anything like that to share, but I, I firmly agree that, that we should use as much local as we can, as much diversity as we can um, for, for all of our various vendors, um, whether it's HVAC or people providing wood or whatever we can do. Um, let's, let's do as much local, as much Nashville as we can. Uh, 
Okay, well, I believe that is it from the public with regards to uh, any chat questions or comments that we've received received in the chat uh, this evening. Again, this will be uploaded. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact me at the planning department. Also reach out to council member Benedict if there are any additional questions or comments. Um, and with that, that concludes this meeting. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Thanks, Andrea. Everybody. Thank you.